this team that's going to present today focused on different aspects of the Thika Highway Improvement Project. As you know, it cost at least 27 billion Kenyan shillings and has resulted in East Africa's first mega highway. Given how much further infrastructure is needed uh, and will be built in the future at great cost to the taxpayer and public purse, we felt it was extremely important that lessons were learned from this highway to ensure that future projects are gaining knowledge and understanding and building the best kind of infrastructure for Nairobi and its region to be truly world class and to really be world class in the sense of having the best quality of, of ex urban experience and life for its citizens and all citizens. I'm just going to flag a few issues that will probably come up today. I think it's clear that a lot more independent research needs to be done around institution and institutional and legal frameworks that are, uh, mat are uh, guiding the process of infrastructure development, issues of public access to information and public input. My colleague from CARA will also speak to this issue. More uh, research into proper environmental regulation and also social impacts. And finally, also design processes, the more technical aspects. How can we build the most safe roads, both for people who are driving on them and the many people who have to cross them, and maybe even cyclists who someday will be <laughs> utilizing the bike lanes, because as we know, safety is um, an alarming issue here in Kenya. And what I want to emphasize today is really that we are encouraging a constructive interdisciplinary dialogue and we are really trying to empower those people who have to make very complex decisions um, in these very difficult and multifaceted infrastructure projects. And we are trying to also encourage a role for uh, universities like the University of Nairobi to pr be providing cutting edge research and technical support for the infrastructure so that Kenyans get the best kind of infrastructure possible for their very rapidly growing cities. This is a very unique meeting, really, when all of you, these great minds with your students uh, uh, to talk uh, about uh, what surrounds, you know, the social, the scientific er uh, environment, and other aspects of the environment associated uh, with the uh, uh, Thika Road as an idea, uh, as an enterprise. This is important. And you are going to end up empowering not only yourselves, not only the stakeholders, not only the participants in this meeting, but there will be ideas uh, to, be, uh, uh, to, to reach uh, those that are important, but they are not, uh, they, they, they are not here. No, 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 uh, by way of summary, Thicker Road is important. If I look at the use and behavior, I use Thicker Road myself. And there are so many, at one point in time, earlier than now, there were very many accidents. But now, I, I think uh, uh, you people have looked at how to minimize, and there are less and less accidents. But, but the use and behavior, sometimes th there are many lanes, as, as you, because that's why you are, you are here. You see a truck, a, a big lorry on this, uh, this lane, uh, uh, another big one on the next lane, a matato on the next one, another one on the next one, and all of them are moving almost at the same speed and causing traffic jam. I hope you will be able to make recommendations uh, for the law enforcement agents uh, so that because ideally, if I'm moving slowly, um, I should just make an effort to uh, keep left but overtake the person ahead of me. And if they gain speed, higher speed than myself, they come and move on. And then you leave uh, the passage free for other users. Kara had the privilege, as the apex body in this, in this country now, had the privilege to uh, partner with CSUD 
in looking at the thicker highway yeah, improvement. I carried out the survey and we had the first meeting at Impala Hotel here. We invited the Gara, the Gara residents in terms of business community, the hawkers, everybody along here. We invited people from Karyoko came. We had people from Pagani coming, people from across Madare Hospital. We invited the Mudaiga resident organizations who are on the Liberian. They came to Impala. Here, Nairobi University, I know we invited them. You need to engage with only organized and structured communities. I get a letter as the chairman of Plainsview, I'll come to that meeting. So when the, when the meetings were called for the thicker highway improvement, people who came from Okarioko, especially that, road, that side of the road, Pagani, they said all of them knew about the superhighway. But where the meetings were done, for them to come and participate and say what they feel, they did not know. But they were put on the TV, according to the roads, engineers. It was on the TV, it was on the papers. So those people who read the papers are the ones who went for the, me for the meetings. Other people were not there. So when, especially the ones who were really affected. The others who knew about it, like the business people who own buildings, because they, they are there and they have to be compensated. So they were called officially. Now, our own experience is that uh, we listened to that challenge and we had a very interesting encounter with the public in, a, in, in that area. Now, we organized what we called focus group discussions. We invited now the, the team from Utali all the way to Kasarani and they came there and we, we listened to the challenges. The businessmen who own the Choma Zone, Choma, Choma Zone and the petrol, petrol stations and, and the other kiosk players came to the meetings and they, they were very shocking. They said all they were done is they were summoned into the offices and they were told we want now to look at this procedure of being compensated. Nobody really called them to a meeting and they said for three years, four years, forget about business. You, you see what you're talking about? They were out of business completely, and then they, they didn't even know what to say, because even the money they were being compensated, they were not actually to the market, market value level for their, for their operations. Now, we got, therefore, inviting chairmen, secretaries, treasurers of the organized communities along the riparian. For the sports view, we had the other group now from there, from, from Kasarani, all the way, all the way to Gedorai, across uh, the, 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 the GSU people, and Kahawasukali, Kenyatta University, the whole of that Liberian, this side and this side. They came there and we listened to them. even the estates, people living in those estates along the, the, the superhighway, this side and this side. Unfortunately, when we did the survey, that was now last year, July. It is when the dust, the dust was on. Yes. Professor must agree with me that I don't think there was anybody who was eating in this canteen at the gathering. The dust that was in this place, you couldn't believe that the dust was moving. We went inside, three kilometers inside this way and three kilometers inside this way. And the report there was very shocking that they had experienced heavy hospital uh, challenges with children on issues of respiratory cases because of uh, 
because of uh, the dust levels. When we reached Thika, we were at Coconut Hotel, and we had challenges of uh, who, what the blind, the blind people came there in doves. There were over 20 people. And what did we discover? They said the superhighway is good, but nobody considered that we shall be crossing the superhighway. The blind people. How do we cross? Even today, at the thicker highway, it's at, the, at, the, at the thicker is where we got only a response that was very interesting. We got a policeman, and we invited them all along. A policeman came, and he was concerned that they have been pushed out of the superhighway, and there are a lot of challenges because they have to go and attend to the accidents there. And they were, according to us, we looked at it, we saw they have lost revenue, and that was the complaint of the policeman. So revenue had gone. The cripple, the crippled people, we had very many people physically disabled at Iroiro and crossing the bridge to them was a very, a very discouraging issue in terms of what was considered about the physically disabled. The Maasai came and Nazema, Munazema ngombe haita pita hii barabara. Ngombe na buzi haita vuka kwenda kule kwanyasi ka au upande huu. So now, the slaughterhouses are across the other side, and they have to take the cows or, or whatever, whichever way is easier. But there was no plan for the animals. There was no provision. If you are driving and you have a breakdown of pushing your car aside, I think the lanes there now will have to be marked so that it will be a lane, a lane for anybody who is uh, injured to stop and change the tire, put your fuel, or something like that. And that, that area issue, we, of course, we discussed. The other thing I would like to discuss here is that the planned bridges, before we did the assessment, were only 10. After we discussed this, that we brought out the issue with Kenya, they raised them to 18. So you can see the involvement of the civil society brought out issues that added value to the project. Noise pollution, those people who live along the riparian. We, there was a lot of noise. People may not, may not believe it. But even now, with the increased amount, number of cars, the people living next to the roads, there's a lot of noise when, they are, when we are passing there. Cars are at, at full blast speeds. Yeah? And hearing impairment may not be an issue that is very far from if you are living there now and you are an old man like me, even though I look a young man, I'm 63, but you can imagine what we are saying. You could lose your noise, your, your hearing capability within a very short time. Uh, over the years, as you go on, the people where they were digging, they left many, many moon holes. They would dig maram and leave, but I thought they were going to do the, no, the usual covering, which I believe now has been, should be addressed. But we need to revisit the area. We need to make sure that we see they have done what? They have redone, they have covered those holes that they have done all over. Then what do you, what do you discover? When the vehicles were going to get to those marams, they were going through given roads that go to serve specific residents. Those roads were left in a mess because the roads are very heavy. I mean, the vehicles are very heavy vehicles. If they had small tarmacs, the tarmacs were out. And nobody is going back to probably redo them and make sure that the, 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 the residents inside, in terms of social, so social uh, or CSR, corporate social responsibility, they should do something about the inroads where they used to go and get marams. They should really go do, cover the, the, pot, the holes, and they do the roads they used to go and get those marams. So stagnant water, of course, the issue of mosquito breeding came up. I don't know. Maybe medical doctors need to do some research, find out whether the malaria, malaria increase has been noted in that area. Because definitely there were potholes and rains have been there. And what, what, is, the, what is the impact? What is the side effect in terms of the possibility of mosquito? Now, information, there was therefore 
despite the fact that our constitution talks about the right to information, Article 35, and consumer rights. You could not get any information from anybody. You go there, you seek to know how long will this road take, how are we going to be compensated, what are the procedures. There are people who would come to complain to our meetings and we didn't know what to do. We just would refer them to, to the ministry. But I am happy today as the CAJ, Commission of Administrative Justice. I am just telling them, if you have a problem, can you eh, make sure that you, 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 you communicate to the CAJ, that is the ombudsman, and you get the issues addressed very fast. We have to review a lot of literature involving the environment impact assessment itself, which was very difficult to get it, but somehow I managed to get. We re reviewed many other documents, including EIA done in Kakamega. We also consulted various stakeholders uh, along the route, including having a, a forum with the CARA. And I presented uh, some of the findings here in those forums. There were about 200 people um, participating, and that reduced the cost of us doing any more kind of public um, forums because we invited all the kind of people um, when um, Kanaki talked about. They were there, and uh, they were asked to make comments on what we, we did. We also did interviews with uh, the chief resident engineer, we're trying to talk to the Chinese contractors. English was a problem, and therefore we decided to talk to the chief resident engineer, whom we thought and all the information required. He was quite nice. Uh, he's not here, but uh, I would like to acknowledge that he was really useful. He gave us the uh, audience with John Marie here. F f we went there around 8 a.m. and we left. They are almost at midday. He did not want us to go. He, he wanted us to discuss more and more about the road. And uh, he gave us a lot of information, which is uh, already included here. We had other uh, people in, in interacting with Kenna, the engineers there, the Kura, all these people. Uh, we talked to them, and they gave us a lot of information. We consulted an Emma, because we have uh, our students there. They come here, we talk to them, and they also uh, we talk to the uh, management there. And they were also very cooperative, and we are very happy about that. So some of the information we got was also from um, people like, uh, like um, Neymar. And we are very grateful about that. We got the samples, water samples, from upstream, just a short distance uh, around the Grove Cinema on Nairobi River, and a few meters again and downstream. And the table we had is not here, not put it here. Uh, other forums, people saw them, and I don't want to repeat some things here. Uh, we found that if it's uh, dissolved solids or um, waterability or uh, pH, all these things were changing. But I compared them with the NEMA and uh, WU standards, and many of them were permissible. But you could see that really, at the construction phase, there was a bit of water pollution from sand, which was an embarking plant. Even now, even now, the sand is heaped there, and you can expect that sand when it rains is washed to the rivers, and that was being a mountain. We and the, the findings here are based on what was initially done by the, the contractor, the EIA the expert, hired by the contractor. So I have tried to go systematically that way, but the others which I handled, they were talking about rotation and discharge of pollutants into water. That is really a serious thing. You can call it water pollution. We found they are anticipating that there will be a lot of silting and discharge of pollutants. Uh, this could be either oil spillage, uh, buried material, uh, which is uh, spilling over, falling from the uh, rollies and being washed to the rivers and, and the wetlands and so on. That one they are identified. Uh, we are happy that they identified that. And they had proposed that they would um, use control, uh, hard moving activities or have them carried out with special care near the river, stream, and wetlands so that they don't get uh, spewed into the water. We, as the researchers now from the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies, observed serious water degradation in rivers, including the chemical analysis we did. We found that silt in some areas, which was as a result of other material being moved around during construction, 
was serious around Nairobi River, the museum here intersection, Grove Cinema Roundabout, and the Rereka River in Kiambu County. Then there was the issue of removal of vegetation. This was a serious issue where a lot of trees were cut uh, along the, the carriageway, particularly within the uh, road reserve. Uh, it was argued that uh, sometimes <laughs> the vehicle may miss the way and you hit a tree and that <laughs> the fatality may be higher. And uh, therefore, they had to clear all the trees uh, in the road reserve. And they said they are going to plant ornamental flowers and um, maybe one or two uh, trees at uh, some interval. Um, we found that they were actually doing grass seeding, planting trees, uh, and so on. And what pleased us here is uh, because as scholars, we have to be balanced. Uh, we found that, yes, indeed, they planted ornamental uh, flowers and so on uh, in the road itself. The, some of them are quite beautiful. They are coming up. It's quite nice as they grow. Again, we're impressed as an aumentorist that they also used local uh, plant species. I was worried earlier alone that they may introduce alien species like water hyacinth. You know the problem in the lake. But they have introduced uh, local uh, species like uh, kikuyu grass, which is now growing. They introduced uh, other trees. Yeah, this is um, uh, grass seeding at the museum roundabout. Uh, those of you who have um, <laughs> extra highs like specs and so on, you may see uh, the boundary of a uh, university uh, playing ground. That's uh, ahead of there. This is um, the area that has been seeded with the grass. This, I think, is kikuyu grass or something. Uh, and it's coming up. So this is um, very good to provide a good cover to prevent uh, sheet and in Gali erosion. I think this was a good mitigation measure. Yeah, this one is a bit uh, small, but um, it looks like, I'm not very sure, um, like, uh, I think, um, uh, elegant tick. I'm not very sure, I can't see it clearly, but it looks like elegant tick, uh, and that one's a very good tree, uh, even for timber and so on. Yeah. That whereas we are very happy as an aumentorist, uh, in that they are doing the grass seeding and they are also planting in one or two trees here. We would have wished that the major mitigation measure taken is that of planting trees, quite a number of trees, just uh, within the road uh, reserve uh, to make sure that the trees will be, uh, will be doing what we call carbon sequestration. They will be absorbing the carbon uh, dioxide that is being produced by the vehicle traffic. Because now the vehicles may be around 20,000 per day. They may reach 200,000 uh, with the time. And we need trees to absorb the amount of carbon dioxide that might be uh, produced, which will act as um, greenhouse gas and may lead to global, uh, global warming and climate change. That aspect of climate change was totally ignored in the report. They were scooping a lot of soil for one, one place, using it for road bend, leaving the place in bare, and <laughs> that's where they are, they are now going to bring uh, rain the soil, fertile soil from somewhere, uh, and um, putting it there to help the grass to grow, and leaving uh, other areas vulnerable to sheet and gary erosion again. And um, they had observed that kind of degradation, particularly along the steep slopes. Uh, in the drift zones of Roraka, Roiro, Theta, all those kind of basins. You see, I'm quoting the report. And they were saying that they have what they are calling drainage out for channels to be designed to prevent soil erosion. And this included building of gavions to make sure, like in the um, uh, Grove Cinema area here, if you go there, you'll find very good um, gavions which are supposed to stabilize the slopes to prevent or to minimize soil erosion. And uh, that was, we thought, was a good thing to do to mitigate um, the land and soil degradation. These are the gavions built uh, on Nairobi River, just here, the Grove Cinema. And you can see how they are built. They are built in st steps so that if there is any kind of um, rock movement or slope um, and disturbance, it will be captured in the, next, in, in the step there, like that, before they get to the river. And again, there is another step down here before you get to the uh, river, the riparian area. So that again was a very good mitigation mission. You know, the road diversions, there were very many of them. 
and uh, these ro <laughs> road diversions were on very dirty roads, you know, small roads, and uh, the vehicles uh, were many, so they were trying to now use a lot of water, we were leading to water over obstruction. They w <laughs> we kept on seeing them wetting the surfaces to make sure that um, they minimize the dust. They tried to do that, but they really spent, used a lot of uh, water, uh, spent a lot of time trying to keep the ground uh, wet. They could not manage. One particular area, uh, which was extremely uh, banned, as Bwana uh, Kanake said, is the university over here. <laughs> I did not go to the cafeteria that time myself to eat because I knew I would not manage uh, having experienced a problem uh, in Alaka. But there was a lot of dust there. They kept on watering. Uh, every few minutes, the vehicle comes and there's dust. This was because of very many uh, vehicles, and because of the heavy vehicle traffic uh, on the road. It was quite a challenge, though we must appreciate. I'm not an engineer, but I must appreciate the difficulty. Engineers hand um, bent trying to improve a road while it is still being used. I think that was a big challenge, and they tried they did their best to <laughs> keep the dust down, but they used a lot of water. What? Uh, the, 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 the consultant and predictant is that if it rains, then certain uh, sections may get flooded and so on. And they were saying they're going to have um, very good drainage, including box culverts and so on. But <laughs> while they, they provide the, the culverts, and as you have seen also, the gavions and so on, we found that some of the box culverts at the construction stage, not uh, later, now they have improved. At the initial stage, they were leaving these box covered and covered. And you see one here. They have now <laughs> covered them. I think after our friends from the African Roman Bank came here and they talked about the bombs and also warned them about people complaining about storm water. <laughs> the one my friend talked about. So they were not covering them. And that presented an environmental hazard to pedestrians. Just the day we had, I think, a car forum, if I remember, if I remember I, I had taken it before I came to the forum, and I left it uncovered, and there was also storm water running on the road, and I was wondering what would happen if this was, was continued. The road would uh, wear before it was commissioned, but they fixed that problem. Yeah, that was on the university way. You know very well. Uh, our distinguished professor, Professor Ichaga, uh, did a lot of research on uh, the uh, highway, went to a highway, and he must have known how beautiful it was to drive on that road. They, may have, they might have been jammed, but uh, after you leave uh, certain sections, maybe in Gara and so on, you would really enjoy going up and down, what we call undulating ter terrain in geography. Now, what you are saying is that road engineers should when designing, at the design phase, consider aesthetics. That's very important. This is a, a, a part and parcel of best practice on building roads now worldwide. I'm not an engineer, but as an environmentalist, I know that. And we call it green road infrastructure. So we need to adopt green kind of technology. It's part of green economy, part of sustainable environment. But you can see the, the uh, hills, the uh, ranges, and so on have been smoothened. And you, those of you who are near here, you can see the horizon when you are driving. See, the horizon, in the sense of having nice, uh, smooth ride. In the future, whenever we are going to have mega projects like the one we had of um, the uh, superhighway, uh, let us uh, design uh, roads that are environmentally friendly in order to minimize the negative impacts, like the ones we have talked about. Let us conduct stakeholder and public participation throughout the project life cycle. I am if I'm saying um, they met some at the beginning and so on. We would rather have these kind of forums continuing throughout the project life cycle so that even at the monitoring level, we find out whether some of the impacts that were anticipated are, be, are either being repeated and so on. Let us ensure that there is law enforcement on uncompliance. If I'm talking about borrow pits where you are getting material for the roadbed, now you are getting very good soil, very good marum from somewhere, leaving gaping holes there. Now we are not very sure. We are not able to establish this because that was private land. People are not allowing us to go there. We are not sure whether the contractor filled those gaping holes. As Ivrem was saying, these may be breeding grounds for malaria or bilazia.
this project has huge economic benefits to the country. Let's acknowledge that. Let us also know that these economic benefits may be overshadowed by environmental codes later if we don't do the, the, the mitigation measures we are talking about. So let's have approved mitigation measures being addressed, not only for the superhighway, but also for other superhighways in the future. Our methodology involved uh, a desktop review of the design, the documents that we were able to, we were able to get. And then we conducted uh, field visits on which we collected data. On, we did a classify traffic counts for three days. I know it's less than it's allowed for. My professor will say that, but it was just to catch a snapshot or, of what is happening after the road has been improved. We also did observations on the crossing behavior, the pedestrian crossing behavior, uh, an observation on journey times, and then uh, uh, sort of an inventory of the number and the dimensions of the NMT. The NMT is non-motorized trans trans transport facilities that have been provided. Then we also got data on the general road features, the curbs, the drains, the crash barriers, road furniture. And uh, still on the field visits, we were able to, OK, we were just from visual observations. We made an observation on the provision of uh, frontage access or lack of it. And finally, the last bit of is just data management. Okay, uh, now on the findings, we begin by looking at the conditions, the operating conditions currently as they are on the, of the NMT on the road. So we begin, we looked at the adequacy for the NMT facilities, what has been provided and what ought to be. In this, okay, as, of, as, as, as you are aware, or you may not be aware that the road is made up of the, there is the carriageway, the service road, and then there is the, the pathway and the drainage part. It was meant to be that the drainage part will form part of the walkway. But uh, from our observations, we found that despite this having been done and despite the drainage being covered, most of it has been covered now, Professor, I believe, most of it has been covered. But you find that at every driveway, there is an abrupt stop and you have to go down the driveway and then you walk the driveway and then you go up on there. On, you continue on the pavement. So this, there is that interruption and they have tried to make a slope of some gradient so that you, they, the, the interrupted is not, I mean the, in, the interruption is not so much. And then uh, the same, uh, after the drainage there is the psychopath that is supposed to be used, the psychopath is supposed also to be used in, by the, by the pedestrians at some time. There is a lot of NMT, NMT conflict. That's a conflict between, say, a bicyclist, I mean, a cyclist and a, and a pedestrian. A cut, the small cuts, there's some, not the big cuts, there's some small cuts that are using these lanes. There's so much conflict. And then there are some bollards that have been elected on, I mean, erected on those uh, pathways to deter the use, the abuse by public means, the matatus, the I have a photo of a public, I mean a matatu on those, on those, um, those paths. These bollards, they have, been, they have been erected in twos. They're causing some obstruction. So this is deterring the, the cyclists from using them and they go on, to the, on, the, on the traveled way. Then uh, still on the conditions for the NMT, they have, in, on the driveways you find vehicles parked and this blocks the NMT pathway, and then the, the people have to walk, the pedestrians have to go back to the service road. Did we observe the, the crossing behavior of how, how people appear when they are crossing the road. Some appear stressed, I mean relaxed, others stressed and nervous, and others literally run across the road. So the P1 to P14 are the service stations which were, which were, which, which we, on which we made observations, ranging all the way from uh, just as you go down Mudaiga, I mean Pangani towards Mudaiga, and then at Mudaiga, uh, at Save, Save is P3, then at the GSU, round, the former GSU roundabout, the, the, on your way to connecting to Outer Ring Road. All the way, P14 there is, uh, is at the thicker, thicker flyover, the thicker entry, thicker exit. So as you can see from our observations, we find that the children, 
uh, the, the three categories, the, those who cross the road relaxed, those who are nervous, and those who are running across, they are equal. They all, it's a third, okay, approximately 30%, 33%. That shows that the road actually poses some danger to the children. The children are perceiving the, the, the crossing for children is a bit difficult. And mind you, this is where we have, most of these stations, we have some provision for pedestrian crossing, except P8, P7, 8, and 9, which are, one is at the, just after Ruiru, there is a place called Hakairo, I don't know, above uh, the, 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 the railway bridge. I don't know how many of you know the place. There is also at Peponi School, where we don't have crossing facilities. Uh, if you look at them, the percentages of people that are nervous, for example, along P8, the adults themselves, they are about 174 nervous cases. If you compare that on the percentage alone on that row, I mean on that column of P8, 174 is quite a high percentage. But for the others, the stressed beat, I think, okay, no, okay, the stressed beat for most of them is way above uh, 30 percent to which shows a, a perceived danger you would actually see the people crossing and looking back and forth to check if the vehicles are coming now with that come to the operating conditions for the motorized trans, motorized traffic where you find the speeds these are speeds uh, observed on those locations you can see peponi school where i said you have the highest percentage of the nervous people the speeds there are at about 20 kilometers per hour this is, at that point, there are, no, there, there are no crossing facilities even as we speak. So it will be in uh, recommendations to, to, to make a recommendation that something be done on those uh, places. At Juja Preparatory, there is a footbridge, but you can see the speed there, the maximum speed there is 104. You find that since the road has been done, there is an increase in vehicle speeds. And uh, the vehicle speeds... There is a, a, a there is a relationship, a known relationship that when vehicle speeds increase, traffic accidents increase. We are yet to get the data for the traffic, the traffic accidents. We are yet, we are yet to get the actual data as of. I'm sure you know the statistics keep changing because there are so many. Okay, let me not be subjective. There are quite a number of uh, accidents along that road, so we'll get the data and we'll cooperate it in our final report. Other locations also are experiencing the same as you go along, along the road. Then for the public transit, they are, okay, inadequate bus stops. By inadequate, I mean in number and location. You find that in places where initially people are accustomed to picking their matatus, for example, the Roisambu, the Roisambu area at the Kasarani uh, interchange, the matatus have changed, I mean, have converted the service roads. That's where they are picking the passengers. And it's actually, the service road is actually unusable. That's in terms of the location. In number, the same case, you find that maybe in number and size, because the bus stops that have been, yes, we understand the, the public vehicles are, are not supposed to wait for the passengers there. But at least it should be able to accommodate three or four, given that there are quite a number of routes flying along I mean, uh, on that road. Then we have, in some instances, for example, the slip road. The slip road down here, the geometric design that encourages a wrong turn. You find that instead of people taking the entire globe roundabout, people just make a wrong turn. I'm sure you must have observed this. People just make a wrong turn onto the other side of slip road and go onto Moy Avenue. Then there are some unexplained obstacles on the traveled way, which cause quite a, uh, some danger to the motorists. And then the weaving and the margin and the diverging sections on this road, there is an imbalance in that you find people from the four, the say three lane travel way merging onto the, or exiting onto the service road. You find that there is this imbalance and some retrofitting is being done now. You must have noticed some points they've reduced, they've uh, made a, a, an effort to reduce, or rather to, to restrict some vehicles from making some turns to, to merge onto uh, I'll give an example of that Pangani place. There is a report that was done, and the contractor is now implementing some of the points there. One of them was to reduce the, to, I mean, to reduce the number of turning movements or the number of vehicles that can move from one side to the other, especially when they are moving from the three lane to the two, to the service road. Then you find that the crash barriers are good, but some of them 
uh, we are not trying to kill the driver when he veers off the road. We are just trying to prevent, yes, the accident from happening here. But some of these crash barriers, I'm sure you'll see in some plates that are coming up, they are concrete bridge parapets. Yes, they are okay. We need them. We understand that. But I think uh, we could come up with a design that would be a bit forgiving on them. Yes, the road does meet the mobility that it's supposed to be. But at what cost? What, what about accessibility? We have had some businesses complaining, court cases ongoing. You must have noticed some petrol stations. You cannot access the petrol stations. As you go mor towards Moranga Road on your left, the national, the national petrol station there, you can't access it. There was a co bill somewhere, you can also not access it. So what about that? And then the other thing is, what, what about the barrier effect? What about the communities that have been split on either side of the road? You find that, uh, for example, at the, at the, at the Will Mary, where, where you have Will Mary, where the Nakumat um, Dika Road was demolished to pave way for that roundabout, you find that on this side you have residentials, but on this other side is where you have the shopping center. Yes, there is that uh, flyover there, the, the overpass there for people. But is that really enough for someone who is towards the very far end or someone who is coming all the way from Gumba Estate, which is down there, to come up all the way or to make some several turns if he's driving to come to this other side? So again, the speeds have somehow, uh, er I mean, they have somehow um, intimidated the, the pedestrians from crossing the road. Yes, there are the footbridges. There are 18 footbridges, as I understand. Okay. To be, to, be, to be made up, but the road is entire is 45 kilometers. So what does that translate to? About 2 point something kilometers per, per bridge. So someone has to walk 2.5 kilometers to get to a footbridge. So um, those are the issues that I'm saying. We need to discuss them. These are, as you can see, they all have question marks. We need to discuss them and find out what, what to do in this, uh, in this forum. You find that some of the service roads, especially towards town, the, the Mudaiga area, you find them congested in the morning and there is traffic jam. And then, uh, what about the safety? As I say, the speeds range from 30 kilometers per hour to 120. You, you saw the table yourself. What about the safety? The high speed increases the accidents. Uh, we will get the actual data to put in the report on the accidents and that's when we'll get a clear picture. So. As I said, uh, the pictures are a bit, I don't know if you can see them. But to the far left corner, we have a, a central island or a, a channelizing island that's been hit. Those, those who are close can see that it's been hit by vehicles. And the, the, the signpost there that was supposed to, to somehow warn the, the, the drivers has also been knocked down. So if you look at it, the corners are quite scraped by the vehicles. Uh, below is you. You have a, a a W channel, but you see it's facing. It's so. If a vehicle came, for example, and hit it from this other side, there is one at the museum hill that had been hit. It. I unfortunately they, they removed it before I could take a photograph of it. It had been hit by a vehicle traveling from uh, that side and hit it, and it had actually been turned upside down. I mean, uh, had been turned, and I'm sure the driver must have uh, had quite some serious injury. On this other side, on my, on my right, you find the bridge parapets that I was talking about, the concrete ones. Yes, we understand they are good, but you see, if someone veers off the, veer, off the road on this side and hits it, what happens? Okay, at this time, or rather, maybe the recommendation would be to have them sloping towards the ground. Although, again, now, the issue would be, what if the vehicle now hits it at high speed? It's going to maybe over town or something. Anyway, the pedestrian crossing there. But look at the cab in the middle. The cab, someone with a wheelchair can't use that cab. It's too high. Even for someone, an aged person can't use that cab. It's a bit about 250 millimeters from the, the, the road, I mean the roadway. So what needs to be done? Yes, they are putting up a footbridge here. Yes, it's, it's, it's actually the, the, they've, done the, they've done the foundations. But what about such places? Because I believe, like at the university here, the same case is there. I'm sure oh, all of us must have used that at the same t uh, at one time. The cab at the center is still high end. 
someone in a wheelchair can't use it or someone whose mobility is, is a bit who who's challenged mobility wise can't use it then bottom here you have the pedestrians crossing the, this is still the same location with the top left uh, photograph here you find the the pedestrians crossing yet the vehicles are still coming they are, they, they're not stopping for the vehicles to I mean for the pedestrians to cross there, there are some studies that have been shown I mean have been known it has been known that pedestrian crossing somehow increased the accidents at some some of the locations because the driver comes at a high speed to intimidate the pedestrian from crossing though the pedestrian knows that that's the right place to cross then the other issue with this pedestrian crossing is the pedestrians cross there, so it just makes sense for the public service vehicles, these matatus at this corner, to stand there, I mean, to stop there and pick the passengers that are crossing. So those are some of the issues. I, at the moment, okay, we will be addressing them or coming up with recommendations to make in such instances. Those are people going over the crash barriers. I have several photos of those. These are just two that I decided to put here. So we need to add the crossing facilities and at the same time educate the people on where to cross and how what not to do then again the public uh, the matatus the public service vehicles as i said they stop at the pedestrian crossing if you look closely down there you see that they actually smack right in the pedestrian crossing and we need to educate the drivers that they don't they don't do this right Besides the, the, the stopping, or rather the stopped vehicle, there is the Ngara, the, the Ngara bus stop there. They could just have gone to the bus stop and just go the passengers. The same case, this photo, this one must, uh, you had seen it earlier, where vehicles don't stop for, ped for pedestrians to stop, I mean to cross. We need to educate the drivers to give, to, give, uh, to, to know that that's, uh, the pedestrians have a right of way at that particular point. At first, we, we had a uh, CARA representative that dwelt a lot on the fact that uh, there must, could have been uh, inadequate public consultation. I will not vouch for that. As a bank, we know that uh, we cannot be engaged in a project that uh, is not well designed and has got no ownership from the public and the stakeholders. Uh, personally, I have a lot of reports in my office on public consultation. So as to whether they were effective or not, that can be debatable. But uh, there's been a lot of consultations that I must say. And even recently, the bank hired a civil society consultant that came from Tunis down here and talked with uh, community groups, civil societies in Kenya, particularly on this project. So a lot of things have happened. They might have not happened at the right time of planning the project, but a lot of things have since uh, been cooperated in this project to improve uh, ownership and, and uh, service delivery. Uh, the other issues that you've mentioned are somehow too wide to be considered. For example, when you're designing a road project, a standalone road project, like provision of water and sanitation and, and all that along the, uh, the project corridor. Uh, my professor here would attest to the fact that uh, road engineers today do a lot of, uh, of uh, we consider a lot of these planning issues, but there is an extent because we have a budget to work with. If, if you want to do roads throughout the, this, this part of town, the 27 billion we are talking about will be, we will be talking maybe twice or three times the amount. What happens actually is that when you do a road design, you provide, for, you provide uh, for example, for opportunities for other infra pieces of infrastructure to, be, to interact with this particular facility. So if you are talking about water supply or, uh, or sewerage systems, there must be conduits left at some points on the road 
to allow for these services to be later on be developed and to interact with the, with the facility. That has been done. There's a lot of uh, openings left on that project. I've personally been involved on that project and I can attest to that. Um, you, talk about, uh, you talked about again, uh, the project is not over by the way. It's not completed as yet. We still have one year when the contractor will, 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 will for example, if there is any breakages, some damages, um, rectify this. It's given one year or two years. They, we call it defects liability period. So uh, they've not gone out of the project as of today. So if there are roads that they've damaged as a result of uh, uh, sourcing for materials way beyond the project area of influence, um, there are a number of road, roads that are being now done also under the project, and the government is financing this directly without our, our assistance because our budget must have been exhausted by now. But part of them are well conceived. Some are meant to improve traffic circulation around Thicker Road. If you do Thicker Road only and you leave the surrounding mine accesses not done, the traffic jam will still be there. And the government has put a lot of additional significant amount of money to repair some of these access roads and to do roads like Kipande Road. They were not part of the original project. Uh, if, if you are using this road here, Arituku Road, you know there's no connection with, with, with the road at Museum Hill. That has been an additional change in design to improve traffic circulation around this place. Uh, the other issues of um, safety. Safety is a complex issue. It's not an engineering problem per se. It has other elements of human behavior. It has other social issues surrounding it. And the engineers are not sometimes not very best at addressing some of these issues. But uh, as, as you heard from these other latest studies, that uh, a lot of retrofitting is taking place now. The number of foot over bridges that were envisaged at the beginning, later on uh, it was realized that they were not sufficient, given the context of this road. When it was being planned, we didn't have a lot of uh, settlements along it, let's say beyond KU. That place was like failed, but now I see a lot of floods coming up. So this has necessi necessitated incorporation of additional infrastructure to ensure that the communities, riparian communities along the road, interact positively with the highway. Because we design for people, we don't design for vehicles. That's the philosophy that some of the engineers may have not uh, uh, understood well. And so you want to do a super highway and you want to do 120 kilometers per hour and you think that's the best that can be. Or, or you want to say we have a freeway like uh, in the West. I would say that uh, that is not a very positive attribute. And uh, learning from this particular project and going into other projects in the city still, some that are involving our finding as, 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 as ADB, uh, there are a lot of things that, uh, a lot of aspects that were not taken care of in this particular project. For example, you see foot over bridges for pedestrians. We are encouraging subways for pedestrians because pedestrians uh, traditionally, uh, I mean ordinarily, do not like uh, going up when they are crossing the road. The road that before they would walk across easily. So that change is not very taken, uh, I mean, conveniently by pedestrians or and road users. So in other projects that you'll see coming up, we've, we are emphasizing the need to ensure that you don't make pedestrians detour from their natural path pathways. So a lot of these things are taking, uh, being considered in other designs. Uh, this particular design of the highway, I think we came later on in the project. But others, because they are now taking place when we know at least we have some funding somewhere earmarked, we are demanding that we get engaged and we see the designs before we confirm the availability of the budget for those roadways or, or transport facilities. So the accidents you've, you've seen or you have, you've you, you, you've read about on Thicker Road. Uh, in the at the beginning of this year, there were about 
about almost 70 between between January to, to April. And thereafter, as a bank, we, we had a, 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 a mission that came from Tunis and from Nairobi to address this particular issue. And after that, you saw the bumps. We forced the implementing team to put bumps because the contractor had not put the signages that you now see. And the roads were now wide, not marked. Speeds were quite high. Naturally, motorists respond to an open space. And that's what was causing that kind of a problem. And people didn't know how to turn, where to, which route to take. That, that was the confusion. And uh, if you look at traffic data, traffic crashes data, you'll see that there was some improvement towards Ju from June coming to, to, to September as a result of the traffic calming measures that were incorporated in the road. Some of them are now being removed because we have signages in place. We have uh, other road furniture to, to guide and encourage proper usage of the facility. Every project like this one must have a negative impact. They had in the U.S. when they did theirs. They had them in Europe when they, they were doing their road transport facilities. But it's, it's upon us to see how well we can mitigate uh, these negative impacts to ensure that the environment we leave for our children will still be, I mean, better for them. Um, but another important thing that I, was, I wanted to mention also the, conceptually is that uh, when you have a road like Thicker Road, as engineers we are, we are governed by three factors when we are doing a highway. The function of the highway will dictate the shape. The shape is the standard that the road is being done. How many lanes, what curves do you adopt? If you want a terrain that is not monotonous, then we are talking of very low speeds of 20, that we are basically providing access in the rural area. When we are talking about a freeway, a superhighway, the terrain must be monotonous because we want to improve the speeds. The speeds will not be improved if when the gradients, the vertical, <coughs> the gradients are higher. The gradients must go down. If you look at our specifications, we say if you are doing a road of class A, which is this one, the highest gradient you can have is, seven per is less than 7%. So if you go to, to, to Utali area, you must dig it down and bring it down. And some of these aspects also uh, have impact on safety. If the speeds go up, the driver must be able to see people crossing the road at a longer distance. So all this come into play. The engineer plays with all this in his mind when he's doing the road. So we need environmentalists to also understand us when we are talking about the shape and the function of the road. The usage is what is being confused here because people are living all over that place. So the usage cannot, we must be careful that the usage does not compromise the shape and the function for which the road was designed. That's why we are providing accesses around it. We're doing what we call the service roads. Service roads should ensure that the businesses that were existing there before are not significantly disadvantaged out of the facilities there. But there are some that will be disadvantaged, like the, 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 the petrol stations that people are talking about. If you do a road of, you expect the, the speeds to be 100 kilometers per hour, you can't ac leave accesses every other 50 meters for people to be diverging to their homes. Into, you know, you are going to create crashes on that road. Because somebody doing 100 kilometers per hour, knowing that the road is open, all of a sudden sees a matetu stopping to get into a petrol station. Do we have enough distance, we call it breaking distance, for this guy to react, break in good time and, and move away from that trajectory. <coughs> so we are in an arena where we are talking about uh, with social scientists. But I'm an engineer and I've also been trained in planning. My second degree was on urban transport. I did a lot of, a lot of planning. I also have a business degree. So I know what the importance of business. And when we are doing the road, we are doing the road so that it can improve the ease of doing business. The ease of doing business in Nairobi is not dependent on a few people and a few businesses on this corridor, but the entire city. If, if, if this corridor is not functioning, we can't get produce from central <coughs> Kenya to Mombasa 
and other parts of the country because they'll take three hours here. You're still waiting for the road to open because you want a few people to be given accesses. We have so much land in Nairobi and some of these things must be radical and that's why we are telling them, yes, the road is good, it's meant for economic, uh, I mean it improves the economic outlook of the city, but we also have sacrifices. They are losers and gainers. In economics, I was told that there are people who must lose and others that must gain in any activity that you get involved in. I saw the road when it was uh, dwarfed in 1971. And I wrote a paper about that particular uh, design. Fortunately, the paper did not come out because what I had said, according to the consultants, did not happen. But nonetheless, we are very happy to see this kind of uh, uh, kind of road in this part of Africa. But let me just emphasize what he said. Uh, roads have functions, and we have classifications. That's why we have class A, B, C, D, E, and so on. And uh, when you talk about class A like this one, it's really an intercontinental, I mean inter international road. And that means uh, the main objection, the, the main object is really throughput, as he has said. So really those people who are, who are lame and those kind of things, <laughs> it's not really meant for them. And uh, we have those classes, we come down to access. Access roads are the ones which uh, uh, pay attention to some of the things we are talking about. The issue of road safety has been with us for a long time. A studies which we carried out a long time ago showed that 85% of the accidents are caused because of social behavior as opposed to the design of a highway. And I'm afraid we even many years ago took Road Safety Council to Finland and I was in that team in 1980 and we went to spend two weeks in Finland to learn how they are able to cope with road safety. Our main problem today here is that the values of our society, I don't know how we shall address them. And you see them, young people, they want to run when they see it's a nice road, why not? Um, and so on. And they die in the process and they kill others. And fortunately, uh, we have not been able to address this. And uh, it is something which I think since we have social scientists here, um, it is something which means that we look at this problem using multi-pronged attack. And that's why I, I was happy to hear that there is something about uh, having a training school for retraining some of us. People like us now, I cannot dare drive in some of these roads now. Because uh, <laughs> although I got my driving license more than 40 years ago, really, I find the, 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 the drivers uh, very careless and this kind of thing. And we need to do something. We cannot run away from our responsibility. Let's, let's see what we can do. And I think it's something you can, uh, you can have recommendations on. Uh, having said that, uh, we have the issue of mass transit. I mentioned how we had done a study, urban study for the city of Nairobi, and we had worked out uh, things about mass transit and so on, and I'm very happy to hear some uh, positive indication from the bank. I would be very happy to see something happen because our prayers would have been answered. Let me finish by saying this is a project which was economically viable, and that's why the bank was ready to <laughs> help us. Am I right? And I have read the, I have read the, the documents, the design, whatever. We have taken our students around to see the project and so on. So I'm very happy that uh, we have accomplished what we have done. But that does not mean we don't have issues. The question is, how do we address these issues? In my view, these are issues which can be addressed with time. And I think uh, from here we can make recommendations to those who are responsible. For sure, those of us who teach, this is something you'd be surprised, like I said earlier, we have not been teaching this kind of dimensions which are now coming up, where we find even the Constitution is asking us to be available to answer questions. 
safety issue in this country is also culturally uh, driven and the attitude of our people. And what you do about that is really so the social scientists to, to really get into the brains of our people and the young people. However, there are people who also insist that uh, the public transport in Kenya is one of the major uh, killers other than uh, Dika Road. And to my own opinion, it's not until we remove some of the matatu and those who claim that they will reduce the number of employment, I doubt. In fact, probably we shall create if we have the transit uh, system uh, uh, the, the, the bank is suggesting. But I'm not an expert on that area. However, Vika Road uh, development has also improved in terms of human health, in terms of air pollution. When the vehicles are congested, you take four hours, three hours, two hours to thicker, and they're in a jam, the emissions are more dangerous than when a vehicle is very fast. When it is very fast, we start now addressing climate change problems. So let's have no doubt of that, that uh, Thika Road has also achieved in terms of environmental improvement. Imagine the population which was selling vegetables at, is uh, that Yeah, that roundabout. All those people, I used to see them. We have no, the, the unfortunate thing in this country is we have no data. And probably the government should be told in point blank, please try and fad young students and, uh, and, and, and faculty members to do research, simple as it is, because if we have data, we could compare it with the current present uh, situation there. But we don't have the previous data. But learning from the developed world or from where research has been done, that road has helped to remove the people who are circulating in that roundabout, the number of vehicles which were getting congested there, and the inhaling emissions which were more, had a stronger health implication to those people. We don't have the data to see how many died and how they were surviving and how their lifestyle, but at least, believe me, from MANA studies, that was more dangerous than the current uh, situation. The thing is, we also have this study, this, this, this study I, am, I, I believe and I have been always questioning uh, whether we are doing our environmental uh, audits the proper way and with proper ethics. So that is very questionable from NEMA. And I know NEMA has the problem of uh, expertise, but still you are improving from where you started, you are improving, but that is one area. Because some, I, I think some of the EIs we receive are to please the contractor than to do it ethically, professionally, and uh, you know, say what it is. Because the fact that a contractor has paid an EAI, he should not do what the contractor wants. Money, or you better shut it off. But uh, those are areas NEMA should also address. That don't pick everything we give you just because I'm a professor or uh, I'm whatever you, you can call me. The other thing is that also institutions which are funding these things, Issues like the quality of visibility studies. Some of these issues should have been picked if there was multidisciplinary approach to the visibility study. You are going to remove a kiosk owner who is who, who's probably dependent at 20. How the fact that the road is more important, it takes priority, but still we are not supposed to be inhuman. So there could have been some kind of assessed compensation to get rid of that guy. But the road is priority. Because believe me, that load, of all the things the engineers have quoted and Kara, that load has a better economic future than all the other negatives which we can solve on ourselves. The other thing is contract attitude. I'm, I'm, I, I think I want to be nice to the contractor, but sometimes I think his habits were very uncouth. Very uncouth. Today, you drive, you, you know, you leave them. The road is very nice. By the time you come back four hours later, especially if it is at night, there is a heap of sad light at the middle of the road, and there is nothing telling you there is. I nearly rode twice or three times, only that I was on, normally I, I don't drive at high speeds. And the, the same sad, if a matato is in front of you, it blows the dust, that means you can't see properly. So there were also a very uncouth habit of the contractor in concerning the human safety and the well-being of the Kenyan people. And that is my feeling. They did a good job because our contractors were doing shoddy jobs. I can see the quality, 
but definitely it, is, it was never not the best. And, and maybe these are things we should be recommended and, uh, and, and properly done. So studies at universities should be okay. Uh, the ADB, when you consider subways, first of all, do a, a, a very good study because subways cannot be efficient if the security is also not efficient because people don't want to go through the tube and then you are mugged. So, and you can study this short one of the University of Nairobi where daytime you can see a lot of students going through in the evening. I think they mug themselves because obviously they are the ones there. <laughs> so, that's something to consider. Kara, if you, have, you are doing a good job, you have good vision, but make sure you have professionals to write whatever you decide and see, write it down and send it to the relevant organizations, the government, even though you are going to engage them verbally. If you come and engage me in an office verbally and I'm, uh, I know I'm making money, I'll just listen to you, say nice things, smile to you, and then tomorrow nothing happens. But if there is a written document on top of the discussions, uh, use the media also to, you know, to, 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 to fight for your rights, I think it's a better way than going on the street with the pre-cards where only a few of us who see TVs uh, will see you on the street singing the songs you want to sing. But you have a good job. Please push it forward, and I'm, I'm very impressed. Well, it's true that there's been lots of Kenyan input into this. I think that there were a lot of decisions made that Kenyans did not know about. There are serious problems of public access to information that I think my colleague from CARA has uh, pointed out. Um, and I think a lot of taxpayers are paying those loans off, and not all of them, uh, and certainly not a significant fraction of them, I think, have had a chance to really participate in some of the decisions that are made even prior to when roads get built, not just in design, but how are roads built, where are they built, why are they built. Those are some of the questions that I think needs to be opened up, because frankly, I think a lot of times people think these are just questions for engineers, and I don't think they are. And I think engineers and economists have dominated this discussion. And so part of the, 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 the discuss this, this is a global discussion about opening up, you know, infrastructure decision making to a broader group of people who can look at all the different angles, particularly because they are so complex. And frankly, to be a little irreverent, we don't know what all the different kinds of impacts are. We simply don't. We don't have good data, we don't have good analysis, and maybe some of it's actually too complex to figure out. But it's better that we put more people around the table uh, than fewer people uh, in this discussion. So I really feel I have to say that as uh, one of the social scientists here. Was, was the planning department involved such as to control and or even plan the development and control the development in this particular corridor? it made that road to be serious in terms of its, in terms of its, uh, its location. And that's the reason why there must be some form of integration of traffic calming together with the mobility. You must balance out because we already have people there. You're not going to say people should be able to move away from there. I appreciate the fact that its, uh, its function required the same. Now, in terms of provision of infra infrastructure, even in our part, we agree with this, as Kara actually indicated. The, re the idea was not to, in to provide the infrastructure. The idea is to be able to work together with other departments so that as the road is being constructed, there must be provision for where water will pass, electric line will pass, where issues to do with the, with the sewage line will pass, so that such kind of provisions are made. So that when those provisions are being, are, are, being, um, are being made, you don't come back and then say, this road, we need to make a route here for the, for the, for the whatever, or we must take a very long route for sewer line or for water line and so on and so forth. When this road was being implemented, the city had just implemented beautification up to around, the, around the, I think around roundabout at, uh, at, Kas at Kasarani. All these are to be removed. The, traffic, the, the, the lighting system had to be removed. The flower had to be removed. The question rises, was there any, any, any kind of consultation between different bodies? Because this was a project of the government. 
Was there any consultation between the different departments, different sectors? Basically, this was, this, basically, this was lacking. So, although mobility, mobility we, we can say mobility objective has been, has been uh, achieved, but the question is integrating, integrating other planning elements, integrating land use has basically been, been, uh, been, uh, been lacking. I think what we need to appreciate first is that there is a lot of there have been a lot of changes and very fast changes. What we need maybe to incorporate here is the sensitization. You see, when change is very rapid, we need to take time. Well, people adopt in different ways, but there is need to take time to digest and accept and follow what is happening, especially when we talk about attitudes and behavior. People are used to roads which they can run across. Not very many lanes, just one. I check, I check, there's no vehicle, I'm sh I dash. But here is four lanes, and I'm used to running across the, the road. Then why should I use the footpath? The footpath is there, but we still see people jumping over and crossing. I've witnessed two people being hit on Thika Road because I work, uh, okay, I go to KU like every day, and I see what is happening. Somebody just jumps and crosses. As usual. So what we need to understand is that there is, there is need for sensitization and serious sensitization on the use of the highway, especially uh, pedestrians, so that they may accept that things have changed and now the behavior must also change. So attitudes and behavior must be looked at uh, seriously. And also to add to that, the issue of seclusion. We've heard that change must come, yes, and development is there. But some people will get uh, se secluded, especially if your children go to school on the other side. The footpath is over there. They have to cross. Who must take them all through? Where is that time to go round and take the kids to the other side of the school? So I think there are, there are measures are being uh, taken or things are being uh, put in place, but more needs to be done. We insist that we have some minimal traffic calming measures to reduce speeds on this highway. Speed is central to road crashes everywhere in the world, as the engineers mentioned. But how can we ensure that people interact with the road safely? But at the same time, we still achieve our design objectives of mobility and accessibility. Accessibility is measured in time taken to travel. If you are still going to take one hour to come from here to Thika, then there was no need of pumping so much billions on that road. So we have to reduce travel time, uh, uh, travel time experienced by travelers on the road, but at the same time in ensure that the safety of pedestrians and the vulnerable ro road users like by cyclists is also improved. So that, for example, I've seen something useful from your presentation that uh, we increase more crossing facilities and partly should be enforced also. If you leave people to use, that road is different from any other road in the country. And we wanted to improve speeds so that you evacuate traffic from Nairobi as fast as possible in, uh, at rush hours. But perhaps you, people don't uh, perceive the positive aspects of this road, the contribution of this road, because other roadways around Nairobi are still jammed. Once this other uh, Uru Highway and Outering Roads are, are done, then you'll see that the circulation of traffic will be much, will improve significantly. Safety will be improved as a result of what will incorporate on these other roads. Uh, as a financial, we also thought at that particular time that Improving road capacity alone will not improve tra tra transport efficiency in a city. And so we also thought we had put a budget to do a mass rapid transit system study, which is ongoing. Once this is, uh, is completed by the end of next year, we have a commitment. We are keen as a bank to partner with the government to see that we have tramways, light rail systems, uh, bus rapid transit systems in Nairobi to encourage people from discourage people from using private means cars to get to public transport. We are talking about sustainability. You can't talk about sustainability when people are still driving uh, on their own vehicles. People walking on very unsafe roadways, 
crashes will go up. You have to address traffic crashes, reduce them, uh, improve the, uh, the, the, the way people commute for their various economic activities, and ensure that the experience of travel goes up. The quality of life, the livability within the urban environment is improved. That's when we talk about sustainability. And that's why we are here, basically, that we improve sustainable transport in the city of Nairobi and any other cities in Africa, for that matter.